Hi, good afternoon. If you're in India, or good morning, good evening, good day, whatever time it is where you are. Um, welcome to the philanthropy and fundraising track at Church at 2020. Uh, our compliments to Nudge for putting together such an incredible event at such short notice in such constrained times. In fact, the event itself may be proof if we needed it that remarkable things are possible and the remarkable opportunities that this crisis is presenting us with. Uh, this track is hosted by Asha Impact, the Britspan Group, Nudge, and the Center for Social Impact and Philanthropy at Ashoka University, which I have the privilege to lead. My co-host for this session is Britta. Britta is a partner at Britspan, and the session is titled, How COVID is Shaping Philanthropic Responses and Strategies. So how is COVID shaping? philanthropic responses and strategies. That's the question we put to an array of philanthropic leaders and they sent in their responses by video. The two questions we asked them were, what have you learned and how will that learning shape your future, future strategies? We'll show you their responses and then Prita and I will speak about what patterns are emerging from those responses and what gaps, if any, exist. And then uh, we'll open this up to Q&A for where all of you can ask your questions, please type your questions into the Q&A box. Can we have the video, please? The COVID pandemic has been an extremely humbling and learning experience of a lifetime for me. It has taught me how many problems facing us can only be fought collaboratively, strategically, and with years of meticulous planning and execution. That we really need to get our priorities straight, both as society and as individuals, and focus on what really matters. It has also proved to me and hopefully to others, how important purpose and dedication is to getting things done. Without NGOs and frontline healthcare workers, can you really imagine what kind of a crisis we would have been in the middle of, either from a humanitarian perspective or on the healthcare front? And yet, how does society treat these professionals? We have a long road ahead and the social sector will have to play a pivotal part in rebuilding society. I don't really have all the answers to how it's going to do this, but I do know that it's going to rise to the challenge. It will have to do so by reshaping itself along the way in service of those that it serves. I wish everyone in the social sector the very best on this long journey. Thank you so much. The Michael and Susan Dell Foundation committed $100 million towards its response to the current COVID crisis. As we were planning the deployment of these resources, there were a few observations and learnings from the environment that were clear to us. The crisis had come unannounced. We did not have the time to prepare for vaccinations, for treatments, or even the lockdown. So our response needed to be speedy. We did not have the time to overthink or overanalyze solutions. We decided we need to lead with our strengths and the experience of working on the ground that we've had for several years and to actively collaborate with other partners who bring in complementary expertise and experience. So collaboration was key. Speed of response was the other core element. And the third element I would say is a strong focus on the low income communities that we serve. To begin with, we committed $20 million towards the therapeutics accelerator that was set up by the Gates Foundation and the Wellcome Trust, both of which have significant expertise in the healthcare sector. Closer home in India, we leveraged our own work in the livelihoods and the financial inclusion space and collaborated with a few funders to help set up two funds that would support low-income gig workers as well as the micro and small enterprises. In the area of education, again, 
you know, backed by our own experience, we collaborated with several ed tech companies to provide products and solutions to the low income government school students. Uh, more recently, we've committed support to the Action for COVID Task Force that was set up by the OBC community in India, trying to see how technology can help us find scalable solutions for testing, tracing, containing, and even treating the virus. Across all of these, I would say collaboration has been a key element. You know, one says a crisis unites people and then divides them. Clearly, we are in stage one. The level of uh, active participation and uh, collaboration that I see across the ecosystem, whether it is the government, the philanthropists, retail donors, private sector, nonprofits, social enterprises, I think everybody has come together to address the crisis. It's a moment of connectedness. And as we move forward, I really wish we can continue this connectedness, continue this journey, look at our key areas of healthcare and livelihoods and together address the crisis. Our purpose as Omidia Network India is to support entrepreneurs in the private, public and nonprofit sectors who help create a meaningful life for every Indian. In light of the current situation as a first step, we move quickly to focus on the health, safety and well-being of our own teams and the continuity of operations that that brought about enabled us to significantly step up our responsiveness to our partner organizations. What we've also clearly learned is that the financial distress to large sections of the population, daily wage earners, migrants, etc., is severe with the lockdown resulting in the cessation of most business and work activities. A survey that we supported in the last few days shows that additional direct benefit transfers, including cash transfers, have already begun to flow to people in the below poverty line category. And that's clearly a positive thing. Nevertheless, the economic impact of the pandemic will be clear, will be deep and prolonged across the board. The slowdown will most impact the vulnerable sections of our population, large swathes of India's next half billion, whom we seek to serve. Atomidia Network India, the vendors, the daily wage earners, the gig economy workers, and small businesses. When Omidia Network India announced a rapid response window to fund proposals that support the lower 60% of India's income distribution in managing and mitigating the challenges that come with COVID-19, we saw a really strong response from organizations, both for-profit social enterprises, but especially from non-profit organizations. We saw proposals that strengthen containment, detection, and treatment, that support crisis management capabilities, and enhance resilience and recovery in the wake of COVID-19. And it's been heartening to see the number of responses we've received to the call. Many of them involving collaborations between groups of organizations that sought to pool their respective strengths. And clearly this sort of pulling together is going to be really important going forward if we are to pull out of this crisis. While it isn't fully clear yet what the medium and long-term responses will need to be, there are some themes emerging. For example, we see a strong need to focus on informal workers and migrants in cities and to understand what can be done to improve service delivery to them uh, and, and to improve the quality of their lives in our cities. There is a need to communicate welfare benefits clearly and accurately so that beneficiaries can indeed make use of these programs in real time as their livelihoods are hit. We think philanthropy will need to be quite responsive to these emergent needs while also supporting all of the work that nonprofits and civil society have been doing both in response to the crisis as well as before. First heard about this dreadful COVID-19, I was full of anxiety and was very self-absorbed about the safety of my people, whom I love, my family and myself. And that anxiety even entered my meditation space. But then I started hearing about the plight of migrant workers and how they were working for miles, not reaching neither their home nor their place of work, how they were starving, dying. And suddenly I felt a great sense of gratitude that my God can make me up. What plight they are doing. It was a very sobering experience. And earlier in our philanthropy, 
We used to believe that we must focus on one thing and do it well. And we decided to spend most of our funds for education. Not only using funds, but we were actively involved with the two NGOs, Akansha and Teach for India, and spent our time in the third with them. But suddenly we realized that you can't just focus on one cause because all the causes for development are so interrelated and we'll never solve the puzzle unless we look at different causes. So one of the things, we may not even give money. That may not be possible to every cause. But understand it, study it, and do some advocacy. For example, we have, I didn't realize that migrant workers represent 8% of our population. And if you take the families back in the villages, it's almost 25% of people who are living below poverty level. And for such horrid rules and regulations, for example, their ration fund, which they might have got in the village in another state, is not valid in another state. Can we do something about that? In cities, they have to pay 10 rupees to have a shah and 5 rupees to go to a toilet. Someone like me who needs to go every half an hour i become bankrupt, just pay and just joke it. But we really don't know about that yet. We really, we, we were vaguely aware, but we were not touched, not in any way. I think we cannot be so indifferent. And we have to do some advocacy, all of us who care. Because how can people in this century live in such dismal conditions. And in the long run, we are not safe unless everyone is safe. We have to realize that. And we sitting in a nice, comfortable home, say they don't follow social distancing, they don't wash their hands. If you're ten in a tiny room, where is the question of any distancing? When we have one bucket of water for cooking, for everything. How can you wash your hands 20 times a day? So come back to reality. Realize what our people in India are going through with and without COVID. And do something before another COVID comes and gets all of us. In terms of learnings, I think uh, there have been many. Uh, this crisis over the last eight weeks has certainly tested uh, many of us. Uh, but I think there are two that I would like to kind of highlight. One is uh, when the crisis first hit, like everybody else, we were really inundated with calls for, for support. Um, and I think it left us a little confused initially as to what our response should be, as to what our stand should be. But I think we took the time to pause and to figure out what we were really good at doing, what we could do. And therefore, I think it shaped our response over the coming few weeks in terms of reaching out to each of our organizations and learning from them firsthand as to what needed to get done. And I think that really helped. Uh, that shaped our humanitarian approach uh, you know, to, the, to the crisis. The second thing is also about behavior. How should the philanthropic system re really behave? And that led to the creation of the common charter uh, you know, and the common values that we must espouse over this time, not just of flexibility and uh, empathy, but also of uh, you know, partnership, of collaboration, of sharing and communicating. Um, I think that is something that we have learned out of the crisis. Ultimately, I think we want to look back 10 years from now 
on not only on how much we did, but how we did it. How was our behavior over this period of time? I think that is very, very important. Did we do the very best we could? Did we collaborate as a team? Did we push the boundaries of thinking? Uh, did we create new ways of working with civil society? I think that is really, really important. In terms of what uh, you know, we need to do over the coming months and years, I think this uh, one needs a, a long-term approach. It's not just post-COVID, but it's just the kind of institutions and policies and systems and structures that the country has built over time. And what really needs to be undone as much as what needs to be built newly. Uh, it's very clear that our institutions and our structures did not support the communities that were the most marginalized and the most vulnerable at this time. And therefore, what as philanthropy we need to do around this. The second thing, of course, is really around helping organizations, not just with funding, since there is going to be a funding crunch in the months to come but also in terms of helping them give them time and space and support and thinking support around how they would need to reshape themselves after this, how they need to really look at their programs from a more uh, long-term systemic lens as opposed to just providing uh, you know, support and relief in the communities that they work with. I think that's going to be real. Hi, my name is Sunil Vadwani. I'm involved with two foundations in India. One is the Wish Foundation based in Delhi, which works to strengthen primary care systems in low-income communities using innovation and technology. We currently operate over 500 primary care clinics in partnership with government in states like Rajasthan, Madhya Pradesh, Uttar Pradesh, Assam, and Delhi. Uh, over the last six years, we've served over 10 million patients with free, high quality primary care. With the advent of COVID, our team is now working uh, double time because we're also helping many of these state governments with setting up COVID crisis response center centers, setting up teleconsultation networks so that physicians can connect with their patients, but without direct contact. Uh, we're helping set up isolation wards in remote rural areas. Uh, the other foundation uh, was set up by my brother and myself in Mumbai a couple of years ago, and that's an artificial intelligence institute. And what we do is we apply the power of data science and artificial intelligence to addressing key challenging issues in healthcare, in education, financial inclusion, and so on. So we have teams working on applying AI to tuberculosis. How, we, how do we detect TB earlier? How do we treat it better? We're applying to AI in areas like better maternal and child health, farming, and so on. With the advent of COVID, uh, we now also have teams working on doing epidemic forecasting for the central government and state governments in India. Uh, we have a team working on how to try and detect COVID through the sound of a person's cough into a smartphone. Uh, and and uh, something like that could truly be applicable globally uh, if you're able to get that to work. What's really impressed me in the last uh, few weeks uh, with the advent of COVID, I mean, this has been an absolute tragedy and it is causing so much misery for so many millions of people. Uh, but what's impressed our team is the power of partnering with government in, in implementing solutions on a large scale, the power of partnering with other like-minded organizations, and finally, the power of, of uh, innovation and technology in addressing some of these very deep issues. Going forward over the next coming months and years, uh, in both our foundations, we are redoubling our efforts to strengthen the public health system in India. Uh, my, my own dream is that in the next 10 years, by the year 2030, that every citizen of India will have access to good quality primary health care. Uh, that is the ultimate solution, and that is what will help us avoid and minimize the impact of issues like COVID and any other similar issues. Working together, we can make that vision happen. We must make that vision happen. 
Hello, good afternoon. My name is Pradeep and I'm with the Ford Foundation. First off, thank you for uh, providing me this opportunity to interact with all of you. Um, let me just get to the two questions that are asked of me. First, uh, what are the lessons, uh, I guess, as a philanthropic organization that we have learned from this crisis? Uh, very briefly, two. One is that uh, inequalities, whether they be economic or gender, uh, still need to be addressed and are, in, my, in our opinion, a top priority. We've always believed that as a foundation. We've always been focused on it, but this particular crisis has, I think, uh, put some more spotlight on how these inequalities are manifesting in various ways. The second lesson, I guess, is, and this is a, this is a, this is a lesson that has proved me uh, wrong in some ways. Uh, the second lesson, I guess, in a way, is it has shown how uh, philanthropic organizations and even um, corporates in crisis like this are really uh, can come together and work and quickly act. Uh, I was a little cynical about this uh, previously, but this has proved me wrong and I'm so happy at how these organizations uh, cutting across different um, priorities have come together to work. Uh, what we need, to, the second question I believe is, what uh, will we be focusing on, what we need to do uh, moving forward? For us again, a couple of things that we, we are going to focus on. One is, uh, though most of our activities now have been focused on immediate relief, I think uh, at some point of time, hopefully not too far in the future, we all need to focus on the resilience. Resilience can mean different things for different organizations. We as a foundation are asking ourselves, what will it mean for our work and our grantees when we talk about resilience? We still don't have all the answers, but we do know that that's an area that we want to work on. Uh, two, and this is a continuation of the work that we've always been supportive, which is that we do need to build, uh, we do need to focus on institution building. Institution building is key and core to increasing the efficiency of organizations on the ground, be it uh, universities, institutions, uh, nonprofits, uh, whatever you have. I think we all need to go back to the drawing board and see as philanthropic organizations and funders, how can we be better and do a better job of actually helping in, in institution building? Thank you. Very strong emotional and mental commitment that this is the right thing to do. And if not now, then when? Right? And that was a very strong and important orientation that we, we pivoted to very early and very quickly, both at Bipro as well as the foundation. And obviously the might of the foundation is much bigger, at least from the philanthropy side, than Bipro. So that was one. We did that. We decided very quickly. The second is we decided our priorities and our focus very quickly as well. So we said we wanted to focus on two things. You know, we said we wanted to focus on the humanitarian side, and that was the first and foremost and most important thing to do. And we would try and do that both by providing meals, hot meals, as well as ration and working with our partner organizations that we trust and we work wherever we could reach the last mile impactfully through, through their support. And so that's what we've been doing. So, you know, it's an interesting combination because Vipro as a company has leveraged our industrial kitchens that we have on our campuses. You know, we have large campuses that are not being used at the moment. So we have a large campus here in Kodati, which is on Sajapur Road in Bangalore, where we have the ability to produce about 30, 35,000 meals for each meal. And so in 24 to 48 hours, we got that going. And our biggest concern was, look, we can produce these meals. So we're producing about 65,000 meals just from that campus. Now we're producing something in Pune and then something in Kolkata as well. But by far the Bangalore focus is the largest. But our biggest challenge was, hey, look, we can produce these meals. And now they're ready on our campus, but now what do we do, right? How do we now get them? And so fortunately, we were able to find great partners within the government. And I must say the government was incredibly, incredibly helpful in saying, look, we will pick it up and then we will work with partners to get it down to the last mile. And this has now been about 15 days and I think it's worked really, really well. So that has been one focus on both meals and ration and supporting people. So today we're supporting about 20 lakh people every day. And that number is going up, but uh, that by far is the most important need at the moment. And that's what we are prioritizing in the short term in the next 30 to 45 days. Uh, the second thing is on healthcare. What can we do on healthcare, uh, which is a much more complex and much more nuanced issue. You know, I've been on a couple of calls with government in the earlier days. And the, the challenge was figuring out, you know, understanding demand and supply, understanding the availability of supply, uh, understanding where the demand was most, 
ensuring people are not chasing the same supply. When I'm talking about supply, I'm talking about the classic things, you know, N95 masks, PPE kits, ventilators, you know, all the way from the simplest to the most complex. And it's taken us a bit of time, but over the last few weeks, we've been able to now identify supplies. I think the government is also doing a neat job of matching supply and demand. So people are working on the same data and not sort of at cross purposes with each other. But, you know, we've now gotten to a rhythm where we're going to supply about 50,000 kits every week. We've identified about 20,000. And uh, it's starting to gain momentum. And that's our big focus at the moment. We're also going to identify, uh, we've identified a few, the, the, the PCR, the molecular testing uh, equipment. And we're starting off very small. We're starting off with about 10, but we're going to provide them to a few states and maybe that will scale up basis how that works. So that's the other thing that we're looking to do on the healthcare side. And then the third, the third thing is awareness building. You know, I was talking to a civil society organization on Friday, and one of the questions I was asking them is how much are people actually on the last mile aware of what is happening and why it's happening and what you're doing and why you're doing it and why this is important and relevant. And I think we shouldn't take for granted that people understand that because if people understand it, you know, uh, it's a much more uphill battle. And so we're spending a lot of time on awareness building as well. And that's on the largely driven by the foundation. On the Bipro side, again, we're trying to use our spaces. And so one of the things that we are doing, and we're just in the middle of it, is we're going to offer to the state of Maharashtra, one of our campuses in Pune, and offer to set them up a 450-bed isolation hospital, right? And try and do this over the next four weeks, if that is something that they would like to consider, which we will set up, we will fill it with equipment, we will get a skeletal staff, and then the government can enable, you know, true medical staff to come in and actually run the... Uh, run the hospital. So our focus is largely and predominantly on the humanitarian side at the moment, very quickly picking up on the on the healthcare side. How do we support our civil society organization and NGO partners that we support, right? I mean, we oftentimes have very high expectations for them in terms of the kind of uh, reporting they give us, in terms of where they can spend, where they cannot spend, in terms of cash flow and how we can support them then how in many instances we can help them completely pivot. So they could have been in SpaceX and you now require them to be in Space Y. And so the objective of that note was simply to encourage people to be supportive. And my request, if any, that I would make to people who are supporting in any capacity, anything, is to really reorient your focus to the crisis at hand because it is of epic scale and it is very, very, uh, uh, very basic at the moment and so any support that you can give to reorient your philanthropic efforts uh, your charitable efforts to the crisis to the humanitarian crisis the need is acute over the next 30 45 so Pritha has quite a range of responses there and yet there clearly are some common threads what do you see as the sort of big trends emerging from listening to those videos but also all the work that you guys have been doing uh, with philanthropists in recent times. Sure. Thanks, Ingrid. Uh, in some ways, it was very inspiring to hear the full range of philanthropists talk about their experience because I think many of us in the morning, it has now become muscle memory to first look at the case count, pretty much like you're following cricket scores, but of course, this is much more grave to follow the increased number of cases, mortality per day, recovered per day, etc. But in some ways, being on this track with philanthropy and civil society actually fills you with hope because you see the extent of rapid action and mobilization that's taken place. So maybe I'll touch upon three or four themes that I thought I'm hearing from the range of philanthropists that were on video, as well as the other conversations we have had. And maybe just one point where uh, it'll be good to see more action. Um, and then I'll hand over to you, Ingrid, to um, reflect on what you've seen. So I think the first and foremost point that I think everybody from Vidya to Geeta Goel to Rishad Premji, everybody spoke about was how important collaborations, partnerships, uh, working with each other and for each other is so critical and has worked well in these times. Um, and as you, many of you know who are listening in, uh, the Britspan Group very recently launched our knowledge study on philanthropic collaboratives. Uh, actually, just in February, before the whole country went into 
uh, a state of panic and then lockdown of course and what was striking is that when we did a survey of 13 plus collaborators uh, almost 100% of them said that their organizations working solo is not as powerful as coming together for large and complex problems. And it almost seems like crystal ball grazing because, you know, at that point in February, when we put out this statistic, we were looking at collaborators that are working on complex sustainable development goal issues. And about 91% of those surveyed said that the costs of coming together, although it is a big investment to coordinate across so many people, government, civil society, philanthropy, research, but they still said that the benefits of collaborating far exceeded the cost. And that was 91% of survey respondents in February. Um, and I can imagine that now if we do it, probably we are like close to 100%, if not a full 100%, as we heard all philanthropists say how they've really come together, starting from macro level interventions of the therapeutics accelerator by Gates, Welcome Trust, which Dell Foundation has contributed to, to very micro level action to really help people's lives. So I think that for me was the number one point that stood out in everybody's um, talk. The second one is, I think, about investing not just in programs, but in institutions. Again, this is something that we have all been talking about in the sector that, you know, don't just look at programmatic investment, just like you're doing it in the private sector, build strong institutions and organizations that can withstand any crisis. Uh, and now we are living through a crisis of a epic scale, as Rishad put it. And I think we're all hearing words like emergency, disaster relief, war, crisis, and not words that you would otherwise hear in the social sector. You know, the, So it is of a scale that's going to stay with us for a longer haul. And I think in those times, seeing these philanthropies invest very quickly and pivot towards investing and in building strong organizations. And we heard even Pradeep talk about Right now, we are reacting to an emergency relief, but can we build resilience of partners and communities? So I think that was the second theme that stood out for me very strongly. The third one was just the speed yet flexibility of response. Um, and often one talks about uh, elephant analogy, right? Where uh, you have a, a strong strength um, and resilience of uh, an animal coming to it with all its power to the issue. But I think what was impressive in hearing everyone speak is it was not just that elephant-like strength, uh, but also the speed and flexibility that came with that size, uh, which I think is very unique in these times and we don't normally see that always. Uh, and what was I think striking is, for example, whether it is um, dealing with the food crisis, uh, you know, Rishad spoke about pivoting the Wipro kitchens to produce 10,000s of meals uh, and supplying them or indeed about responding speedily to bring together responses for migrant workers, or in fact, putting together quarantine centers from a public health perspective. Uh, I think there's just been such a range of impressive, speedy, flexible, but strong responses by multiple philanthropies. Uh, and I think here, I just want to make this point that uh, early in April, when Britspan, along with several other partners, looked at about 500 NGOs, only 13, one, three, 13, 15% of them in early April said that they can see their financial runway extend beyond a year. And that was out of 500 NGOs that we did a very quick survey with other partners. So you can imagine at the start of the lockdown, uh, our nonprofit civil society are calling for help in terms of flexible, speedy, and institution building response. So it's great to see the philanthropy side hopefully matching that call uh, to give a coordinated response. And I think just the fourth and final point I'll touch upon is how inequities that are already existing in the system get so much more pronounced at crisis times like this, whether it's disabled people, the elderly, uh, and India is a very rich cultural society where the elderly live in societies as opposed to living at the fringes of societies. Or if you talk about other forms of inequities, whether it's women, vulnerable children, um, you know, LGBTQ communities, I think it's critical for philanthropy, as we heard many of them say, to come together to support uh, and not accentuate these inequities in the system. So to me, those were the four themes that shown out. Uh, and one area where I would call for more action and um, more attention is probably the community level. I think 
given that this has been such an urban and city focused issue at the moment uh, probably the level of community response has been much more at the civil society level and of course we heard the videos of philanthropies but i'm hoping that over the next few months um, as we look to strengthen primary care with sunil badwani spoke about or msmes that i know rockefeller foundation or dell is working towards we are really going to go closer to communities to give them that voice and understand that we are addressing needs that are rising from uh, communities and population that are in uh, most dire straits so i think that's the only one that i would call out as uh, probably more philanthropic action required from what i heard right now thanks for that thank you uh, the only couple of things that i'd add really was i think certainly in my lifetime it's the first time i'm hearing organized philanthropy speak with such strong voices on the idea of of addressing root causes you know i mean there we for too long i think in the last couple of decades really focused on getting very narrowly focused on a particular metric and and the shift from that sort of silo mentality where i'm looking to shift the needle on one metric to being able to talk i mean even that taboo word advocacy finally made it into a couple of their statements uh so i think you know while there might have been some trend in recent years to move upstream for philanthropy to go from funding program to funding say capacity building within organizations i'm hoping that this really will galvanize or accelerate uh, a shift towards being able to address complex issues in their complexity and to be able to look at you know root causes of which our country doesn't lack uh any um uh, rather than simply treating symptoms uh i i think whether you know there is this call really i'm hearing from all of these people to reexamine our assumptions to look at public health as fresh to look at urban development as fresh uh to look at inequality in all its uh, dimensions as you mentioned and to i think you know what 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 people call the overton window might have the aperture might have opened a bit where things that were politically unfeasible uh even 3 months ago are suddenly politically feasible whether that's universal basic income or whether that's you know uh universal healthcare or cash transfers or any of those modalities which were really you know all the evidence was there but there wasn't really momentum or traction uh behind them the second one i think is i mean to hear from each of these people real empathy real compassion they're not in the main talking about these as you know antiseptic issues there's a sense that somehow the bubble of privilege has been pierced here and that people now seem to really get that the vast majority of our fellow citizens uh who live on the margins uh and the, the kind of conditions they live in and the kind of uh, precariousness of their existence is finally coming home to people in a way that you know, these are people that are all around us and yet they're invisible to us whether they're nurses or front other frontline health workers or police people or sanitation workers they literally all around us and then we don't see them i, I think it suddenly sort of brought them into view in a way that uh, most people probably haven't seen before and finally i think i i really like what they have said about focusing not just on the how much but on the how i think you know to hear from each of these um philanthropy some degree i think of humility in terms of what do we know what do we not know and you know a much more responsive uh, approach to their philanthropy in terms of listening deeply to what partners are saying and what communities are saying and responding to those uh, needs rather than coming in with some a priori sort of assumptions about what works or what doesn't um i was actually surprised that technology didn't find more mention uh besides the need but one is uh i think i i think i think maybe this particular group of philanthropists may not in that sense be representative uh, of all philanthropy out there which i think is putting a lot more emphasis uh on more technocratic uh solutions uh and then of course there's my favorite philanthropic pet peeve uh which is yes we need to get to the root cause of the issue then yes we need to build ngos that can deliver sustainably flexibly responsibly but we i think as fast as the response has been as comprehensive as the response has been we have paid a huge price still in delays and inefficiencies because of the lack of what that infrastructure layer organizations like yours and half a dozen others that we have is so 
underserved in terms of this philanthropic infrastructure that allows us to accumulate knowledge and allows us to share data that allows us to make connections easily i mean i'm so envious of countries where within days of the crisis hitting representations from civil society organizations were in parliament or in the us congress i'm so envious when i see that the finance the, the secretary of treasury in the uk has announced a 750 million pound support package just for civil society in the uk in india we've heard about support for msme for uh, gig workers for migrant labor but i haven't heard a single word about a support package for civil society which is going to need it because as you said most of most of civil society organizations operate on such thin financial margins uh that three months or six months from now as the real impact of the financial crunch that is coming you know as csr budgets dry up as money gets focused on covid relief leaving poor programs uh, unfunded uh is really going to hit hard not just in terms of so the, the organization sustainability but jobs job losses and then of course finally our ability to serve the constituencies and communities that we serve um i think the uh, last piece really that i think maybe we need to add to the agenda or keep reminding people about is that as much as the immediate humanitarian needs and the social and economic needs need addressing that we also have civil society organizations that are focused on democracy human rights freedom of freedom of expression privacy surveillance uh data ethics and so on and so that that's an area i think we're going to have to highlight a bit more um i will take it now to questions in the if you've been sort of keeping track of the questions that have been coming in would you want us to sort of share some of them with us sure so i think the first question ingrid we have and i'm going to just do you want me to just tell you a couple and then you can both of you can answer them sure. um so i think one major one that i've seen across the board is how do you think philanthropy will change with covid so what has worked uh, and what needs to i mean what are the pitfalls the, the positives and the negatives of philanthropy as a whole uh, the other is how can non profits play a role in channel in channeling philanthropy more effectively so what has worked for non profits and potentially now what they need to change in the way they function and um, i think a lot of people are asking about transparency which is a very different one they're saying uh, should there be a transparency of funds uh, both from the philanthropic side and the government side to understand what is happening um, in the system potentially bring in the technology that you were mentioning uh, might be the time to do that now uh, so i think those are a couple of questions right now um, and there are a bunch of questions on sectors that are not addressed by philanthropy so will what will happen to those sectors um, you mentioned uh, some of them but there are a lot of others uh, in people have talked up sex sex workers uh, and other areas that are not addressed at all uh, so those are some of the other things that they're asking philanthropy what will happen to those sectors and will they all die down or will that work be affected in some way those are all my questions for now prita do you want to take any of those um maybe i'll start with the philanthropy one and then we can just go back and forth and grid on the question sure. so sure. um just following this session uh you know we've done a rapid five week study on the philanthropic response to covid and how that will change so we'll be covering that in a lot more detail uh in the four to five session uh but just in terms of a quick answer to many questions on this topic i think we're seeing mixed trends so one there are some philanthropies that have um increased funding uh, available to india uh, particularly some of the foreign ones uh, and also domestic ones that have put in additional money for covid whether some of them might be through common funds like um, the give india covid relief fund or pm cares funds or cm funds in addition to some of the work that they are doing on the ground uh but the majority of them we are hearing have certainly repurposed or repivoted budgets that were already committed or were going to be committed but for covid response um and then of course there's a whole range of csr related foundations where it's a mixed bag because again as we are hearing there is uh, even pre covid as we know there was going to be 
uh, da big damage or hit a lot of the economic sectors of our economy, starting from ban banking, financial services, the construction sector was hit, etc. So I think there is an anticipated fall in profits, and hence that is going to affect the CSR foundation spend uh, for the sector and for socioeconomic goals over not just the next few months, but potentially the next two to three years. Um, so I think in terms of the quantum of philanthropic and CSR response, I would truly say it's a mixed bag. In terms of the qualitative nature of the response, I think uh, in the last two months or the period of the lockdown or just before, certainly as we even heard from philanthropies, everybody's scrambling towards the immediate response uh, and also building preparedness in terms of whether it's the hardware, like the centers uh, for quarantining or ventilators or PPE kits and masks, or indeed some of the support to migrant workers, food, rations, etc. But I think over time, philanthropies are also realizing that you cannot drop the core mission that they were supporting. So it's not that, you know, our SDG goals for, say, education or gender equity or, um, you know, financial literacy or digital literacy for women and rural workforce is becoming any less important. Or even, for example, within healthcare, it's not that COVID should come at the severe cost of, say, even other respiratory diseases like tuberculosis, which is killing far more number of people in India today as we speak by the R, uh, or indeed non-communicable diseases. So I think in terms of the quality of philanthropic response, while there has been a lot of mobilization for the immediate need, I think I would expect that over the next few months or years, there would be some level of calibration of the response to COVID or the pandemic, but also ensuring that a lot of the other things don't fall through. But that said, of course, the picture is not rosy at all. I mean, we only have this much of a philanthropic kitty. So that leads to the second question of how would it affect nonprofits? Because there is going to be an anticipated overall lesser money for much level, high, heightened levels of issues in the communities and populations. Uh, so maybe if I'll leave that tougher question to you, Ingrid, about um, you know, how will that look for the nonprofit sector yeah, if you want to take that? So we're almost at the end of our research among nonprofits, uh, which sort of in some senses is almost complementary to yours. Um, and the data substantiates what you just said, which is that most nonprofits are probably looking at 30 to 60 percent drops in revenues in the coming year. The ones that, as you again, as you just said, the ones that are anticipating the hardest hits are the ones that are most dependent on CSR. Uh, the ones that have sort of long-term institutional donors uh, feel, at least at this point, uh, a little safer. Um, the the need for nonprofits to first of all, I think, uh, pivot where they can uh, to to demonstrate their uh, contribution, if you will, uh, to COVID response, I think is, is step one. Step two, I think, is communicate, communicate, communicate. So, you know, even if you're not making a fundraising ask of your donors right now because it's not the right time, just simply be letting your donors know what your situation is, what you're hearing from your communities, how things are changing um, with your staff, with your infrastructure, making those are, make, Putting out those messages in a regular sort of stream of messages, I think, is critical. And thirdly, I think, you know, this it, it could be too it could be late, but it's still be better late than never to really work on building a diversified donor portfolio. To look to know that institutional donors have a role to play in in the kind of investments they are willing to make versus CSR donors versus high net worth individuals versus uh, retail donors. And I think the big one of the under told stories of this crisis so far has actually been the story of retail. Uh, there was data from Razorpay that said that online donations are up by 180%. Uh, I know from the association we have with the Give India uh, COVID relief fund that one third of the almost 200 crores that that fund has raised has come from individual donors. Uh, they're also seeing huge spikes in people's willingness to do these transactions online. It's also interesting to see how some of the causes that, got, that were featured in the question. I mean, I've seen crowdfunding appeals that have actually done quite well for transgender communities, for commercial sex workers, for kids with cancer, for you know, a range of causes that you might think 
are falling off the radar, but are actually being able to raise money online from their niche audiences for what you might call a niche cause. There's even, for example, the emergence, emergence of a platform dedicated to fundraising for these kinds of causes. I don't know if you're aware of democracy, ourdemocracy.in, which is a crowdfunding platform that actually focuses on some of these more difficult causes. So I think in many ways, these were changes that were long overdue and the crisis will simply accelerate them, but it's not going to be an easy 12 to 18 months for the nonprofit sector. And perhaps the other thing that, maybe I'm being over optimistic, uh, but that's me. Uh, the, thing that the, the thing that I hope gets some impetus as a result of this crisis is nonprofits ability to organize as networks and to give themselves demand and get a voice in policy discourse in the public discourse, in the media, and so on. I mean, for too long, the negative narrative about nonprofits being ineffective, inefficient, possibly corrupt, maybe even anti-national has gone unchallenged. And I think this is, it, there could not be a better time now that philanthropy and the public at large actually sees nonprofits value in action. There could not be a better time to organize and start to develop a more inserted coherent voice uh, in the public domain. I'm looking at the time and it looks like we have four or five minutes left, Lindy. So are there any last questions? No, can we just get closing remarks from both of you? Because we have about four minutes left in the session. So. Sure. Pritha, you want to go first? Okay. Since uh, you're chairing, I think you, you get the say to say who goes to Get the last word. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, um, I think given the number of nonprofits as well in the participants list, I would say the very critical thing to do in the days forward is to actually do scenario planning. Uh, it's something we are doing ourselves, even though we are a global nonprofit working not downstream, like all those heroic services that are actually providing support to communities at this time of need. Uh, but I think irrespective of your mission, irrespective of which part of the value chain you're supporting, uh, in the social sector. I think what's absolutely critical is to uh, build out what in your uh, scope of work might be the two or three scenarios, the good case to the worst case, uh, and to plan around that, both from the impact that you're delivering perspective, as well as how do you support your own teams uh, to be resilient and uh, hopefully on roles as we go forward. Because I think what is clear is that all of us are talking about a new normal, but you know, I, I feel there's almost like a new abnormal uh, and hopefully the abnormality will move closer to normalcy in, in two to three years like we've seen historically in other epidemics like the Great Plague and, um, you know, Ebola, of course, was a shorter, but, you know, much more emergency response. But whichever way this pandemic uh, eases out, hopefully over the next months and years, I think it's important to be prepared for this as a long haul. Um, and the second thing I would say is that uh, to be uh, really as individuals in the sector or just as citizens of the country, uh, really much more uh, aware and conscious as civic society, uh, whether it comes to discipline about hygiene or wash practices or indeed supporting other um, disabled or other inequities to be reduced in the economy for each of us to play a role. Because I think clearly what's come out in, during the lockdown is that each of us need to play roles, not just at the organizational level, but also at our individual and community levels. And, and that's irrespective of our mandates. So I think those are the two thoughts that I would leave uh, with all of you. Thanks, Pritha. Um, so there's a quote from Vladimir Lenin, um, where he said, there are decades when nothing happens, and then there are weeks when decades happen. And I think we're in that one of those weeks or those periods of weeks right now. And we're in such, disruption of such scale that in a sense all the pieces are in play you know all the things that you took for granted that you assumed were fixed and unchangeable are suddenly movable now people's the disruption has sort of opened these cracks which suddenly let the light in which suddenly let you have a glimpse into the lives of people and our fellow citizens to you know the possibility that we don't need to uh, let these huge and persistent uh, injustices and inequities to persist. So I, I think the, the only thing I'd like to end with, it's up to all of us 
as civil society, as infrastructure, as philanthropy, to ensure that we build on that momentum and don't lose it. I mean, it's really too easy, as Geeta said in her video, to go from a period of great together connectedness to a period of great division. And that's a real threat in our country. It's an ongoing threat, and it's something that we really need to guard against. Thank you all for tuning into this session uh, on the philanthropy and fundraising track at Charcha 2020. I'm actually going to hand you over to Prita now for the session where they're going to be presenting their, uh, the findings of their report. Thank you all.